All right, so let's take a look at how we detect a virus now. So we've talked about how we can grow viruses in a laboratory or so in vitro, um, in a test tube or a plate, petri dish, that kind of thing. And then in vivo, when we looked at an actual living organism, so for example, in an egg, a uh, hen's egg, for example. Now let's see how we detect a virus. So whether or not we use uh, in vitro or in vivo, once it has been introduced to a whole host organism, embryo, or a, a tissue culture cell, then we can prepare a sample from that infected host or embryo or cell line and then analyze it. Now we can analyze it under bright field microscope, um, under electron microscopes, or fluorescent microscopes. And the different microscopes that are used are based on the different cytopathic effects. Okay, so cytopathic effects are observable cell abnormalities due to being infected with the virus. So these CPEs uh, can include loss of adherence to the surface of the container. So that's something that we can see very clearly is if it's pulled away from the surface of the container, then that means the cell is not acting normal, which means it would be infected with the virus. Changes in cell shape from flat to round. Uh, so indicating a growth of the virus in there, you know, it, not growth, but uh, multiplication of the virus particles, filling up that cell, making it more round, which is not how it normally would be. Uh, shrinkage of the nucleus, uh, so degrading of the nucleus, uh, building up of the viral, viral um, or virions. Vacuoles in the cytoplasm, uh, so vacuoles are like little empty spaces of cytoplasm, little um, kind of empty bubbles uh, that are sometimes seen when a virus is infecting a cell. Fusion of cytoplasmic membranes uh, and the formation of multinucleated succincta which are, um, as it says, multinucleated, many nuclei within kind of a, a mass of cytoplasm. Inclusion bodies in the nucleus, so an inclusion body would be like clumps of proteins, which could be clumps of pieces of the capsid that are being formed, uh, seen within the nucleus or the cytoplasm. And then complete cell lysis, uh, so breaking up of the cell, kind of like we saw with plaques in the bacteriophage. So further pathological changes uh, can include viral disruption of the host genome and then altering normal cells into transformed cells. Uh, so viral disruption of the host genome, altering normal cells into transformed cells, which are the types of cells associated with carcinomas and sarcomas, so cancerous cells. So the type or the severity of the CPE just depends on the type of virus uh, that's involved. So this chart here is not stuff that you have to be um, specifically familiar with uh, this virus and the cytopathic effects, uh, just understand that these are some of the effects. So the succinctum here, um, which is this multinucleation, uh, you can see lots of, of these nuclei within this kind of clump of cytoplasm, and then also some inclusion bodies. Uh, so we can also see some inclusion bodies that are pointed out here. You see these little chunks of, of Proteins and, and nuclear, or, uh, proteins and nuclear information, you know, whether it's copies of their RNA or copies of the DNA. Um, and then some other things here. So the change, there's some cell enlargement, um, and then they form in, in clusters, you can see here. Uh, so you can see here that there are just different things that happen to these cells um, based on viral infection. And so these are the something, some of the things that can be looked at. So we're going to talk about a, a very specific type of assay that can be used uh, for viral detection. We're going to look at several of these. So the first one is hemagglutination assay, which is a serological assay, uh, which has to do with serum, serological serum. Uh, so it's used to detect the presence of certain types of viruses in a patient's serum. So serum is the straw-colored liquid of blood plasma. So if you put blood in a centrifuge and you spin it very fast in the centrifuge, it's going to separate it into different parts. And serum is this kind of, as it says, straw-colored or tan-colored uh, portion of the blood plasma. And this is where clotting factors have been removed. Uh, so we don't have things that, that clot blood, for example. And this is important because this assay is utilizing clotting in order to detect viruses. So the serum can be used in a direct assay. So we can do a hemagglutination assay in two different ways. It can be a direct hemagglutination assay uh, or an indirect hemagglutination assay. So the direct one, called hemagglutination, 
hemagglutination assay, I just want to combine those every time, uh, to detect specific types of viruses in the patient's sample. So in this case, the agglutination, agglutination is a clump, um, and then it's clumping of erythrocytes, which are red blood cells. So the heme part, heme agglutination, uh, is related to red blood cells. Uh, red blood cells have heme in them that allow them to attach to um, oxygen to transport it in the body. So heme is related to red blood cells, and agglutination is clumping. So hemagglutination assays are related to the clumping up of red blood cells in a patient's uh, serum, using a patient's serum. And we'll see how that's done. So uh, remember that many viruses produce surface proteins or spikes, those spikes that stick out of the envelope, uh, for example, or out of the capsid, and those are called hemagglutinins. So these hemagglutinins, what they do is they can bind to receptors on the membranes of erythrocytes or the red blood cells. And what this does is it causes the cells to agglutinate. Uh, so one spike will attach to or stick to one red blood cell, and then it'll have another spike on it. And when that spike bumps into another red blood cell, it'll attach to that red blood cell as well. So what we see is with these viruses that have these hemagglutinins on them, is that they will be attaching to any red blood cell that bumps into them or that they come in contact with. And that ends up as a clumping of red blood cells and then more viruses will be attaching to those same blood cells and then what happens within the body is that there will be this long lots and lots of clumping of these bacteria of these viruses and these red blood cells so hemagglutination is observable without using a microscope uh, but it doesn't differentiate between infectious and non-infectious viral particles so what we can do is we can take a patient's serum, I described it within the body, but what can be done is you take a blood sample from a patient, you centrifuge it, you get the serum portion, which doesn't have the red blood cells in it, and it does not have the clotting factors that would um, be something that starts to happen with blood, as you probably know, is once blood gets out of the body, it starts to clot up, it starts to, to form or coagulate. So they take that stuff out, uh, then what they have is the serum, and they can put serum in little tiny wells in a kind of um, a little dish that has little tiny indents, little wells in it, and then they can put the serum in those wells. Then what they can do is they can add red blood cells, and when they add the red blood cells, then if they see this agglutination, this clumping, then they'll know that there are viral particles, those hemagglutins, hemagglutinins inside of their serum. If there are hemagglutinins inside of the serum, they'll see this clumping of the red blood cells, which actually ends up being, I think there's an image down here, uh, which actually ends up being like a lattice work, uh, this, this right here. So this is actually what is shown here in B. So they, they take the virus, which would be the serum from the person that they're thinking may have a virus in it, and then they are going to put it in a little well and then they're going to add some red blood cells. And when they do that, you can see the little tiny uh, spikes out here, the hemagglutinins, are going to attach to the red blood cells and kind of clump it up and make a type of lattice work here that ends up looking kind of like this in the well. So if you can see up here, if we just have red blood cells um, inside of a Petri dish, they kind of just all settle down to the bottom of the dish. They're not clumping, uh, they're not really attached to each other, they're just all just kind of settling at the bottom. But if we take a patient's serum, and if that serum does have the virus in it, then we see hemagglutination. And this is the direct hemagglutination assay. Now, the problem, as I briefly said, with the direct version is that it doesn't tell us whether or not it's infectious or non-infectious. Uh, so when we have these viral particles, it could just be virus pieces that are floating around uh, in the serum, but the viruses themselves have been destroyed. So they're not actually infectious. Uh, because if the hemagglutinins, in, hemagglutinins are within the serum, it could just be those hemagglutinins floating around and they would still do the agglutination. Now, in order to identify a specific pathogenic virus using hemagglutination, then we can do this in an indirect way. And this is the indirect hemagglutinin uh, or hemagglutination assay. So there are proteins that are called antibodies and they're actually made by the patient's immune system to fight off that specific virus. So our immune system makes antibodies that are specific to a virus that's floating around that the body has identified. 
and then these can be used to bind uh, and they can be used <clears throat> to bind the hemagglutinins that are on that specific type of virus. So the antibodies are made by our immune system cells. They send them out in our bloodstream and then they attach to these hemagglutinins on the virus. The, way, the reason they do that is because they're kind of like markers. These antibodies go out and they're markers marking them for destruction. So then our other immune system cells can come by and say, hey, there's an antibody attached to that cell. I'm gonna kill that or attach to that virus. I'm gonna kill that. So the binding of the antibodies with the hemagglutinins that are found on the virus then will prevent the red blood cells from directly interacting with the virus. So in vitro, so when we're testing a patient's serum, we can take their serum, we can put it in these wells, and then we can take an actual virus to test for that specific virus and put it in the wells also. Now, if the patient's serum has the antibodies for that specific virus, then the antibodies will cover up or attach themselves to all the hemagglutinins on that specific virus. So if that specific virus now has all of its hemagglutinins totally covered, when we add the red blood cells, the erythrocytes, then they're not going to interact with the virus's hemagglutinins. So then what happens, because the antibody, or because the viruses are covered in these antibodies, there will be no agglutination. So then the agglutination has been inhibited. So these indirect assays are called <clears throat> hemagglutination inhibition assays. So the HAI, HAI. Uh, and these can detect the presence of antibodies that are specific to different types of viruses that can be causing infection or have caused infection even months or years after the infection. Because if they're floating around in there, if the antibodies are floating around in there even years later, then this can be picked up because they'll put the actual virus that's specific to the antibody and then they can test for it. So this is what that looked like and see here. So if we take the serum, which in this case uh, would have antibodies that are specific to a certain virus, so we add the virus and we add the serum, which has antibodies, into a well, then these antibodies are going to coat these viruses. And then we're going to add the red blood cells to that. And then what we see is that here, our antibodies are sticking to our viruses, coating them, and then the red blood cells just hang out. Uh, so they're not going to be stuck together like we saw up here. So then what we see is the hemagglutination has been inhibited, hemagglutination inhibi inhibition, uh, because instead we have the antibodies that have been attached to the viruses. So then the red blood cells are just going to sink to the bottom of the well, uh, indicating that indeed the person's serum has antibodies for that specific virus which means that they either currently have an infection or currently have that virus in their body or have had that virus in their body at some point.